I'm Chris Nessie, host of Behind the Mic, Voices of the EPN, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here, and today I'm talking with Jason McKenna, author of the book, What STEM Can Do for Your Classroom. What an awesome conversation. What a cool book. Incredible read. You're going to love this conversation. Join us as we talk about engaging lessons, discovery learning, and looking ahead. Too cool. You're going to enjoy this and learn so much. Thanks for listening. And by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and uh, left review. Could you do that for me? Say a few nice words. And by the way, also share it with your friends, your family, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. Hey, I recently was interviewed by Chris Nessie, the founder of EPN. EPN is the Education Podcast Network. He has a podcast called The House of Ed Tech on there, and he also has his podcast called Behind the Mic. Behind the Mic is where he interviews the other podcasters on EPN. That's right. He uh, talks to us about, uh, you know, why we made the podcast, why we stuck with it, what happened along the way, what equipment we use, what we learned that uh, from mistakes and what we learned from just by doing. And uh, it's pretty cool. And you get to hear from all of us. So uh, good stuff. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, I hope you go sh- listen to it as well as share it with a friend. That'd be so cool. Thanks. And, you know, we, we, we we're very proud of the fact that we have the world's largest robotics competition. And, um, it's in a, the actual fountain arena and there's 15,000 screaming kids there. It's like a nice. rock concert. And every year when we do that, we unveil the new game and the kids are losing their mind. They're going crazy. And I'm, and I'm walking out of it. This, this, that year is in Louisville. I'm walking out of freedom hall in Louisville with the, the co-founder of our company, Bob Mimlich. And like I said, the kids are absolutely losing their mind. They're so enthusiastic. And Bob looks at me and he goes, you know, Jason, they have no idea how much work they're just signed up for. (laughs) And when he said that to me, it was like a two by four hit me across the face. Because, again, as a teacher, that's the magic. That's what we're all looking for. We want to put that in the bottle, right? That's How cool. can I create a classroom where the students are that enthusiastic and that engaged about learning? How do we do that? It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests, and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12, ah, ah, with Dot Steve Maletto. In the book, What STEM Can Do for Your Classroom, author and educator Jason McKenna describes how teaching STEM education in his elementary school changed his classroom and his life, improving his students and his own approaches to problem solving, collaboration, and general motivation to learn, offering examples tried and tested classroom projects, and collaborative strategies, this innovative resource opens up STEM education in K-12 through classrooms in exciting and expansive new ways. I'm so excited to have Jason on the show today. Jason, welcome, and thanks so much for joining me, and say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's honor to be here, and hello to everyone listening in. Well, glad you're here, and I got to ask, ask you this. So, why'd you get into education? I mean, what, what was the, the thought behind that, and we'll go from there. Sure. So I was hired to become a teacher in 1997. I'm dating myself there a little bit, <laughs> but, um, you know, teaching was always something I was very comfortable with. Uh, to this day, I still consider myself uh, to be a teacher or an educator. So uh, I've been in the teaching business for almost 30 years now, if you do the quick math there. Uh, but school was something I always enjoyed. I enjoyed the classroom setting. I, I enjoyed being in school. Uh, so that's why I pursued teaching as a career. And of course, I enjoyed uh, being around children. So I got, like I said, I got hired to teach in 1997 at a small school uh, right outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where my office is still located uh, here today. And I taught fifth grade for my first year. And for the next 14 years, I taught uh, sixth grade. So after about 15 years of teaching, uh, to be quite honest with you, I was a little bit burned out. I was doing the same thing over and over again. I wanted a new challenge. So I volunteered to be put in charge of our school's enrichment program. And next thing I knew, I was being asked to teach robotics and computer science, and I was scared out of my mind. I don't have 
any background in robotics. I don't have any background in coding or computer science. I have an elementary ed and a secondary history degree. And now I'm being asked to build and code and teach robotics. And I didn't know what I was doing. So from there, I went, look, luckily here in Pittsburgh, I was able to go to the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Academy nice. um, on Carnegie Mellon's campus and basically learn about robotics and how to teach robotics. And you know, because I ask a lot of questions and do those types of things, I foster relationships, a relationship uh, with the people that were in the Robotics Academy. And not too long after that, I was working there part-time over the summers. And that's what eventually led to my current position at Vex Robotics. Well, that's cool. So, you know, because, you know, to go from not really being a thing that you do to it is the thing I do. I know I like that for you. Well, know. the thing, as, as I mentioned, the thing I do is I still consider myself to be a teacher. You know, in my spare time, I'm not coding robots now. You yeah, know, right. um, I'm not building robots for that matter in my spare time. But I spend a lot of time talking to teachers about what it is that they're trying to do in their classroom and how potentially STEM can be something that enables them to reach their teaching goals, whether it's for their classroom, for their school, or even for their country for that matter. So, um, you know, I still consider myself a teacher just through different means now. Very cool. So uh, I got to ask you, because you know, before we go off this, I mean, be, being a male in elementary school, you had to be you, you're kind of a, a unique thing, right? <laughs> well, I was often, that's funny you mentioned, I was often the first male that my students would come across, right? So nice. I was the first male teacher. So I would spend the first week of school um, answering emails or answering phone calls to teachers telling them, no, I was not upset with your son or daughter. I was just much louder than the <laughs> teachers they had the previous four or five years. So after about like year five, it's, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb. So after about year <laughs> five, I finally got smart and I would front load this. And I would send a letter home to all the parents ahead of time, introducing myself and just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm loud by nature. I'm probably <laughs> louder than the teachers they had before. So just be prepared for them to come home the first day of school saying, Mr. McKenna spent the entire day yelling. No, I did not yell. I yelled at no one. I guarantee it. Instead, I'm just the first male teacher that they had. Yeah. That's awesome. I was, I was wondering about that because I've I spoken in uh, to the teaching staff at different elementary schools and, and uh, some middle schools. And and you, uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny when you look around the room and you go, I'm pretty sure that I may be the only male in this room right now. And, yes, yes. And so it's cool because it offers different opportunities in the school and what you do as a teacher and stuff. And, and especially one like that, what you're talking about, their first male teacher to have as well. So uh, that's, that's neat. Uh, especially the, the, the type of stories that probably have that go all completely along with that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Correct. I like that. Uh, all right. So let's talk about your book. What inspired you to write what STEM can do for your classroom? I mean, what, what's that thing that said, I got to write this. And then you did it because a lot of people say I got to write this, but they never do it. Yeah, so it's that's a great that's a great question. Um I've been lucky enough to travel all around the world. I've talked to teachers and students about STEM education on every continent from, you know, Rio de Janeiro to uh Toronto to London, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Seoul, South Korea, Jakarta, Indonesia. And no matter where I go, it was very very common the questions that I would get from teachers, they would say, "How do I teach STEM?" And can I teach them? So number one, they wanted to know, you know, how do I how do I wrap my head around these things like project based learning and uh, trying to find multiple ways to solve a problem, integrating science and math together? How do I do that? And then secondarily, can I do that? Same question I had when I first got started. You know, my my school was asking me to teach this, or the phrase I like to use is I'm being voluntold to do this. <laughs> Um, so, so please, you know, how do I actually go through and do this? So the inspiration that I got was I saw a lot of teachers in the same position I was when I first started to teach, you know, STEM and robotics and computer science. I was, I was one day ahead of my students, or sometimes I was five minutes ahead of my students. And that scared me because I was used to coming from this perspective of, I have all the answers. I know this inside and out. So now you're going to, you know, sit and listen to me. And I'm going to, quote unquote, teach you something. Whereas now we were engaged in this process with STEM where we were actually going through these things and learning together, kind of going on this journey together. It was very, very rewarding. It changed my life, as I talk about in the book. But at the beginning, it was very scary for me. So 
the inspiration to write the book was, is how am I able to create a tool or resource to lower the barrier of entry for teachers so they feel comfortable and this is something they can do. I tell people all the time, you know, I'm I'm like the person on those late night infomercials that lost 150 pounds doing whatever. And people are like, if that guy can do it, I can do it. That, that, nice. that, that was me. Especially when I first started because people knew me and they knew I did not have a background or box computer science. And they're like, well, if Jason could do this. Yeah. If Jason can barely teach, he can barely change a light bulb. If he can teach for box and I can do it. So there was a lot of that going on. And I thought, well, wow, that happened with me locally here in Pittsburgh. What if I was able to do that on a worldwide scale? And that was really the inspiration to write the book. That's cool. Thanks for sharing that. That's, you know, and I like that, by the way, if he can do it, I think I can do it then. that's Exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it's funny. But so when I was uh, working with Robox Academy, you know, I would often give a presentation, be myself. It, my peer would be like a software engineer from CMU, right? Or robotics researcher. So we would go through a presentation and then that person would say, are there any questions? No questions. And I go through my part and then I would say, are there any questions? And a hundred hands would go up. <laughs> And this would always frustrate them because they'd be like, well, why aren't they asking me questions? It's because you're a software engineer. I was like, why is a third grade teacher going to ask a software engineer a question? They're not going to ask you. They're going to ask me a question because <laughs> I'm a former third grade teacher. And they're like, I know I'm not going to look dumb in front of that guy. That's so awesome. let me ask him the question. So, um, so again, you know, I'm able to basically show teachers, I don't have a background in engineering. I don't have a background in computer science. If I can do this, so can you. That's so cool, especially because I, I could see exactly what you're talking about. There is no way I'm asking the software engineer something that I don't even know if I can get three words out before he's, exactly. he knows. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yep. That's, exactly. Cool. That's cool. Uh, all right. So, you know, your book talks about how teaching STEM education in your elementary school changed your classroom and your life. Let's go into some specific examples um, that il illustrates this transformation. I mean, what besides the fact that you're using... Um, the robotics and such, what, what, what are some of the ways that it, I mean, it, it changed the way you taught, the way you worked with the kids, the, you know, the types of, um, you know, just trying to create engagement in the, in the classroom. And can you talk from that transformation type uh, standpoint? You know, uh, for me, honestly, uh, this is going to sound cheesy, but it was love at first sight. And what I mean by that is um, I always, for my entire teaching career, for the previous 15 years, I struggled with teaching group work. I had the biggest problem with getting students to authentically collaborate together uh, to do a project. I'd have, you know, the, the one student that was the overachiever and did everything, the other student that did nothing, and the third student that just caused disruptions, right? That, that, was, that was my dynamic when I taught uh, with group work. And I, and I tried everything in order to be able to fix it, and nothing would work. The very first project that I did, the students um, had built the robot and they had to code the robot to go in a square. And they were all engaged. I had groups of three and four students and all of them were doing something to contribute to the success of that project. And I was like, wow, this is, I've been trying to do this for 15 years unsuccessfully. And now it's working. Like what is actually going on here? The second thing was, was that, you know, in the latter part of my career, you know, as things like, you know, preparing students for, you know, the 21st century, 21st century skills, as those things became more prevalent, I was often being asked to, you know, have students find multiple ways to solve problems. I, I'll never forget, I was observed by my principal teaching a math class. And when I got done, you know, you would go and you would, you know, you would sit down, with, I'm sure you did this a million times in your career, right? You'd sit down with the teacher. Oh, yeah. Maybe like, JC, you taught a great lesson, but, you know, our big <laughs> emphasis for the school year is for students to be able to find multiple solutions to problems. And in your class, you did a great job, but there was only one, you only emphasize one way to solve that problem. We have, we have to change that. And I would say, thanks for the feedback. However, there's only one way to solve the problem. So what do you want me to do here? There's legitimately only one way to solve the problem. Like, well, you know, you, you have to, you know, find a more robust problem. Like I tried that. Yeah. But when I did that, the kids were intimidated, didn't know where to start. And, you know, and that, that was a non-starter. So, so I need some, I want to do this, but I need some help. So that project, the students coded their robot to drive in a square. I had four different groups. I had four different solutions. And I was blown away. Completely and totally, but that, nice. that was the big light bulb moment for me. Again, 
I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a roboticist. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even a car guy. Like when I buy a car, <laughs> I'm like, get me from point A to point B. I, I don't care about how it's built, any of that stuff. So I'm not an engineer. So the fascination for me was never around the, the robot itself or never around the com computing language itself. It was none of that. Instead, these things that I was trying to do in my classroom for years, like collaboration, um, being able to solve problems, persistence, right? Persistence, being able to not give up, uh, not being able to immediately ask a question to me, the teacher, but to actually go through and solve these. These things were all done well when I first introduced Robox to my classroom. So then I spent the next few years trying to figure out why. And that's that's a lot of what I talk about in the book is, 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 is why STEM is such an organizer, or such a great organizer for those thinking skills, those collaboration skills, and all those things that we're all trying to do in our classroom. That's so cool because that's, uh, you know, I think about, uh, you know, kind of like part of the transition that you went through as you're learning I don't know if you call it a new field or your area that's new to you. Um, the just the, some of the challenges that could be there, but what a cool payoff there must be because it's an it's an interesting topic. I you know there was a time a few years back where my um, son uh, had joined a robotics club at his school, and oh nice, and uh, they they went to these competitions. Uh, one was called First Robotics, and I forget what the other yep. one was called, and yep. They uh, um, and to watch the teams control these robots because if you think about robots just from TV, you know you you've got uh, the robots, the battle bots that destroy yep. each other. <laughs> yep, R two D two, three PO battle bots. Yeah, yeah, and it, and then, then if you want to, you can go into the Terminator land, which is where we're going anyway because we've got AI now. So we all know that we're getting to Skynet. But sorry, I just thought I threw that in there. But <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that uh, at those competitions, one of the things that was cool was that they would manipulate the robot so that it would go up to whatever this platform was or something. And it had to have a claw to try and open a door. And then inside yeah. the door were different things. Some cases had tennis balls. Some cases had these little bitty, they called them bugs, which were these little <laughs> bugs that walked around inside there that were, you know, little toy bugs type thing. And it had to pick them up and move them out. And you talk about something that, as an adult, it was fascinating to watch that, but to watch the kids doing that. And so I know that it's just one aspect of it, but there's so much to in STEM that I just can amaze. It, it's kind of got a built-in curiosity factor, I guess, is my point. No, that's so that that's such a great point. So um, the introduction of my book, I talk about, uh, I think it was 2017, uh, the VEX Robotics World Championships competition, just like you mentioned. And, you know, when we, we we're very proud of the fact that we have the world's largest robotics competition. And um, it's in a, the actual Fountain Arena, and there's 15,000 screaming kids there. It's like a nice. rock concert. And every year when we do that, we unveil the new game, and the kids are losing their mind. They're going crazy. And I'm, and I'm walking out of it. This, this, that year is in Louisville. I'm walking out of Freedom Hall in Louisville with the, the co-founder of our company, Bob Mimlich. And like I said, the kids are absolutely losing their mind. They're so enthusiastic. And Bob looks at me and he goes, you know, Jason, they have no idea how much work they're just signed up for. <laughs> and when he said that to me, it was like a two by four hit me across the face. Because, again, as a teacher, that's the magic. That's what we're all looking for. We want to put that in the bottle, right? That's How cool. can I create a classroom where the students are that enthusiastic and that engaged about learning? How do we do that? Um, so when we talk about, you know, to your previous question about why I wrote the book, that's what I, that's one of the big takeaways I want to have for teachers when they read the book is that you can have that engaged, enthusiastic classroom. Now, to break that down a little bit further, you know, why? Why is that? Is it, is it because it's a competition? Is it because the robots are cool? So what I did after that is I spent a lot of time actually going through and talking to the kids. Why do you enjoy doing this? Why, why do you keep doing this? You know, and talking to their parents more. And what you find out is that the students can't wait to show you their robot. Why? Because it's their robot. It's not the robot that Jason told them to build or anybody else told them to build. It's their robot. Then they can't wait to tell you about their teammates where we did this and we did this over this person's house. So it's authentic collaboration. 
they can't wait to tell you about their strategy, right? So you see all this stuff about student voice and choice, students taking ownership over their learning, students being able to work authentically with their peers, students learning from their own mistakes. That's what STEM gives you. It's the perfect organizer to be able to do all of that. Like I, like what happened to me in my very first lesson, and then obviously as students go off and they do things like these competitions, you see it even more so. But that's what's driving the engagement. That's what's driving the fun. That's what's driving all those wonderful results that we see out of STEM. So, you know, I when I talk to parents and, and, and I talk to teachers interested in STEM, I say, sure, there's a... Um, there's a uh, STEM jobs are obviously important and there, there's a there's a dearth of them. There's a dearth of people filling those jobs. So we need to be able to, to address that. But at the end of the day, these students that are doing this and the enjoy the joy and engagement they're getting, that they're getting out of it, it's going to benefit them if even if they don't pursue a STEM career or if they don't become a software engineer. This process that they're going through right now, it's going to it's going to improve their thinking. It's going to improve their collaboration, and that's going to have far-reaching effects. You know, no matter what they pursue as they get older. That's so cool. This is it's it's amazing how much of that is. Uh, you know, it's in in some ways, I don't know if you've ever looked at information where they talk about they say things like, "One day when we get to the moon." Um, and, uh, you know, and, and stuff like this. So before we got to the moon and even though we're back in that stage again, one day when we get to the moon again, um, yeah. but it's, it, it's an interesting challenge or thought process when they were, when they're, uh, you know, trying to come up with, um, strategies or things that they're thinking about how to make things work, uh, how to, um, make it achieve what you want it to achieve. And I just think just the natural just tendency, especially with young kids that, they have a natural curiosity anyway, and uh, before we, you know, knock it out of them, <laughs> as, as yeah, well-meaning adults, yeah, there's, but... <laughs> there's 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 a lot of truth to that. Yeah, that's exactly right. But you know, I like to say that um, you know all young students are natural scientists and engineers, so we need to be able to capitalize upon that for sure. That's so cool. I, so let's talk about this. Why do you believe STEM education is particularly vital for elementary school students, and what benefits have you observed in problem solving, collaboration? And learning motivation. Let's just go there. I mean, so, what... so I love to talk about the, you know starting STEM early, you know, and the importance of it, and it really the importance of it is two facets. Uh, number one, just from an opportunity perspective. So uh, there's been a lot of research. Uh, you know, there was a big study uh, by Penn State University of California Irvine and University of Texas uh, that talked about the fact that as young as kindergarten students already form an opinion about their proficiency in STEM. So um, I'm good at this. I'm good at math or I'm good at computer science. Or I'm good at solving problems, all these particular things. And what the research tells us, and that, that, that finding has been validated many times over by educational research. And what we know, in addition to that, not only do students form that opinion, but once that opinion is formed, it's very difficult to change. So uh, there's a lot of schools out there that have a very robust middle school STEM program, but unfortunately, a lot of students are missing out on that because by the time they get to middle school, they perceive this as something they can't do or they don't want to do. You hear you hear adults say this all the time, right? I, I'm, I was never good at math, but I, I was always great with, with numbers, or I was always great with letters, excuse me, or vice versa, right? I have a math brain you know, not, not a reading brain. And that's when we know that that's not true. We know our students can actually learn anything. And we know that there's no such thing as a math brain or an English brain or, or so on and so forth. So it's very important that we're able to provide students with these meaningful learning experiences when they are young. So that they see some, they see STEM as something they can do and something that, they, that they're capable of doing and something they could potentially pursue um, as they get older I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I was lucky enough to participate in my own research um, with the University of Maryland, David Weintraub, and Jimmy Lim from University of Maryland, when we did a study uh, around young students, around STEM education. And what we saw from that study was the exposure to STEM, you know, made them uh, more willing to collaborate with their peers and uh, improve their persistence. So they were, they were more persistent in solving problems. It made them view themselves after the intervention as someone that was more willing to solve problems and someone that can solve problems. So if we're able to reach these students when they're young and, again, provide them with these meaningful learning experiences, 
um, research tells us that we are actually able to overcome that and show that this is something that they can do. So that's kind of the first part of the importance of starting STEM early is being able to reach them before they form those negative perceptions. The second part of it um, is this idea of school readiness. So, so I talk about this, this vignette all the time. So imagine a young student walks into a kindergarten or a first grade classroom, and you, you've been in a million of these classrooms, as have I, right? What's the student asked to do? So they're asked to come in, go to their cubby, bring your book back and their pivots in the winter, potentially their coats, bring all that to their cubby, take out their morning work, put everything else in their cubby, take the books out that they'll need for that morning, go to their desk, sit down at their desk, and then get started at their morning work, right? You've seen that scenario, what, a million times in, in your career, I'm sure? It feels like it, yes. <laughs> yeah, right? So now think about for a second, what we often don't think about is what the student has to do to be successful at that. Well, number one, they have to have the executive functioning skills and the, and the, the ability to control their, control their impulses so that they go to their cubby as opposed to going and talking to their best friend in the corner or going and telling everybody what they did over the weekend or telling everyone what their mom told them that morning on the drive to school, right? So they have to have the executive function to go to their cubby and to follow those directions. Number two, they have to have the spatial skills to be able to differentiate between their book back, between their morning work and their afternoon work identify where their cubby is and put everything in their cubby. They have to have the motor skills to actually be able to perform those tasks. Then they have to go back to their executive function again to go sit down and start their morning work. So all of those things, executive function, motor skills, spatial skills, impulse control, those are all the things that we talk about under the heading of school readiness, which we are doing, unfortunately, a very poor job of fostering in our schools because we don't introduce STEM at an early, early age. Because STEM is a wonderful way to foster those school readiness skills. Hands-on, minds-on learning, which is just another way to say STEM, is how you help students with their executive functioning. Obviously, how you help them with their spatial reasoning. And then obviously, how you help them with their motor skills. So by doing this with our students, not only are you teaching them all these wonderful STEM skills, but you're also helping them with their school readiness. And of course, the importance of that is sadly what happens when that, you know, that young man or young girl does not take out their morning work, does not go to their cubby, does not go sit down and start their morning work. They get labeled as being bad, right? And unfortunately, what we know now from education, research, and neuroscience is that's not a will problem. It says it's a skill problem. And the skill is all those school readiness things that we talked about. So STEM is that's not the only way, but it's a great way to address that skill problem to hopefully avoid that situation where I just talked about where those students get labeled as a behavior problem. And of course, we all know what ends up happening is they lean into that caricature and feel like, well, if I'm going to be identified as a behavior problem, I might as well be a behavior problem. And, and STEM is a great way to eliminate that also. So I think there are a few things in education as important right now as starting STEM early. This is awesome. I, you know, it's funny because it was not so long ago that, uh, well, with me, it's ancient history. But I, I grew up in Florida at a time when you had Apollo and you had uh, um, and the shuttle mission and you had all this stuff that was exciting people. And, that, and, you know, um, and to the point that they were bringing in the TVs during the different launches and so yeah. forth. And, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, thanks to... Uh, certain pair of robots that you mentioned earlier uh, or androids, whatever you want to call them, RTD2 and so forth. And in a couple of movies and it really inspired huge generations about looking into this sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I think it's, I think we're kind of back in one of those time frames again, where there's lots of stuff happening that uh, um, is becoming part of our lives. And if nothing else is being spoken about as part of our lives. And so they see it around them. I mean, you can't go to, a fast food restaurant without some of them are at some pretty high levels of using automated uh, systems. Like uh, at uh, one I'm thinking about uh, um, they, if you order your food at the drive through, um, if you order a drink, by the time you get to the window, your the machine is producing your drink. And, yeah. uh, and that's an interesting thing because it used to just all be people and you see these things in operation. And, and uh, I just, I, I think it's, when we talk about the time frame, how well it fits, because they see evidence of all this stuff um, that could 
combined with having it talked about in school and how, how you do projects like this make somebody, you know, really want to be involved in the, these programs. So you talk about a career, something kind of pointing people in the direction of different careers. It's, it's pretty powerful that way. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, um, you know, for K through 12, uh, K through 12, for K through six educators looking to incorporate STEM into their classrooms, what practical and effective instruction strategies do you talk about in your book? Well, I think you just really, you know, hit the nail on the head there, so to speak, in that we are really living in a STEM moment right now, as I like to say, whether it's about, you know, uh, the James Webb telescope, or, you know, I talk about in my book, Katie Bauman developing the algorithm that allowed us to take a picture of the black hole, uh, the mapping of the human genome, uh, the, uh, the, the coronavirus, uh, the, you know, being able to, to, to um, develop a vaccine for that. All of these things are great examples of STEM. Uh, so really all the, and, you know, and then you can even go even simpler than that and talk about the computer that most of us have in our pocket, which is our, which is our phone, right? Right, right. But all of, so we are surrounded, STEM is ubiquitous, it's all around us. So really just being able to take a lot of those real world examples and have the opportunity to talk about them is really a powerful way to be able to implement STEM in your classroom. So what I like to say is there's no such thing as a bad or a wrong STEM implementation. All you have to do is get started. And getting started could just mean introducing more books in your classroom library that talk about STEM. Uh, that could just mean talking about current events one day a week in which you talk about things like the James Webb, te James Webb Telescope. And you look at some of the pictures uh, that the James Webb Telescope is capturing as, as, as it's out there. Uh, it could be any of these things that we talk about. You know, uh, a subscription to the New York Times will give you four or five science articles a week that you can pull one from. I just saw one this morning that talked about how uh, penguins take 10,000 naps a year. Fascinating, right? 10,000, I Very mean, that's, so. that's life goals right there, right? <laughs> right. So, so talking about those things from a scientific perspective and from a STEM perspective, just by doing that in your classroom is a very powerful thing. And one of the things that I talk about to go back to what I talk about with be, be, still being a teacher and educator, think about the, the missed opportunity that happens every single day because we don't talk about how Katie Bauman created an algorithm to take a pic to, to, to line up nine of the largest telescopes in the world, to capture a picture of the black hole, to uh, prove out a lot of Einstein's theories of relativity that he wrote about 1917, right? We don't talk about that as teachers in fourth grade because that fourth grade teacher probably does not know what an algorithm is. That's the big missed opportunity that we have right now. So start there. If you, if you have no idea how to get started, just simply start right there and talk about those types of things. And, and, and I said, embellish your classroom library, do those things in your classroom to really start that thing around STEM. And at the end of the day, it's really just about your mindset. You know, we want to uh, have our students be risk takers. We want to create a classroom of risk takers. I have a chapter in my book titled that. We want our students to be able to embrace failure as part of the learning process. Well, we have to model that as teachers. So uh, in terms of implementing STEM, just, just try the classroom library, try the current events, try these things around us every single day. And if you don't quite get the exact definition of an algorithm, who cares, right? Uh, it's not that big of a deal. I go back to, like I talked about, I was scared to death to begin teaching robotics. Well, why? Why is that? Like, why was I so scared to be able to do that? And moreover, why do so many teachers have that same attitude? Again, all over the world, what are we doing in the teacher preparation process to somehow imbue all of us with this idea that we have to have all the answers all the time? And as that is a big requirement of our jobs. Like, what are we doing to cause that? Um, I want to find out what that, what that is. And I want to change it. Because at the end of the day, if we can just change that mindset, that is the biggest step. Uh, to implementing STEM in our classrooms. Well, that makes so much sense. And it, it's just uh, um, to, to be able to have access to what we have today. To, and, and just, I mean, we're talking on a podcast here. And yeah. you know, you're wherever you are and I'm wherever I am. And it's become so much affordable that it's allowing people to connect across the, the planet um, to have talks about whatever they're going to talk about. And just talk about the, the, the power of, because uh, it's not so many years ago that, couldn't have done this. You would have had to pay somebody to, to do it for you. 
I'll, I'll, I'll give all your listeners a free lesson plan right now. So you want you, you have no idea how to implement STEM, do this. Uh, on a Monday, go ahead and order a package for your classroom off of Amazon. So, so go into your Amazon account and buy something, okay? And then that package is going to show up the next day. And just talk about that with your students. How was I able to pay for something? How was, was did like, did my money float through the air and, and go to Jeff Bezos, wherever he is? Like, how did it happen? Talk about that process with your students. Talk, think about what would have to happen in order to be able to do that. You might not know exactly how that happens. That's okay. Talk about, just talk about that with your students. Then talk about, well, how did my pack, how did this package get here so fast? Think about that for a second. So how did it get here? Like, is there, is there a warehouse next to us? No, but it was still able to, how was it able to get here so fast? And talk about that process with your classroom. I guarantee you all of your students have probably had a package delivered from Amazon to their house. So now you're making a real world connection with them and you're able to connect that to this broader concept of STEM. Do that, have that conversation with them and you've just implemented STEM. Congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> it's really cool because there's so there's so much that the technology is making either things easier for us or it's making, you know, it possibly easier, but in some ways more complicated. So you have more to learn or more to, to, to make to put to use in your world. And uh, I just think it's uh, amazing how far we've come in fairly short amount of time. I, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's something else. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I want to ask you about is assessing STEM learning can be, you know, provide its own unique challenges. I, yeah. Can you highlight some of the classroom instruction strategies um, you propose in your book? to approach the STEM assessment in elementary schools? So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I have, I have a quote uh, that begins every chapter in my book. And the quote that begins my chapter on assessment is, Mr. McKenna, is this going to be graded? And it's by every, just about every student ever taught. Right? I used to hate that question. It used to drive me crazy when my kids would ask me that. Right. Oh yeah. Um, but what I realize upon further reflection is that, my students were just responding to the incentives that I created for them, right? So another example is, you know, when I taught language arts, I would have the students write an essay and I would, you know, I would circle things, I would highlight things, I'd write comments on the paper. I would turn it back to the kids and what would they all do? They would flip through to the last page, see the grade, then they throw it away. And again, <laughs> this frustrated the daylights out of me. But in my classroom at that time, I was not emphasizing learning. Instead, I was emphasizing that actual letter grade. So if we don't get assessment correct, if we don't get it right, we're not going to do any of these things correctly. So what I talk about is I talk about this idea um, that I first learned from the author, Myron Dweck, in his work about making assessment student-centered. So assessment, instead of something that we do to students, Instead, it's something that we do with students. And that is such a big paradigm shift. It was for me when I first came across it. But that's what I talk about in the book is actually making assessments something that it's, it's a journey again that you do with your students and this process of going through. And it's not something that's just done at the end. It's not something that's bolting on at the end, but it's a process of discovery of reflection, of reinforcement that you go through during the entire process to really um, make that entire learning process more engaging. Because the other thing that we know from educational research is as soon as you begin to slap a grade on something, that's when learning stops. And that's obviously what we don't want, and it's especially what we don't want in project-based learning with STEM. So um, what I talk about in the book is, is things like co-create learning targets with your students. So you know, when I taught, I would put the lesson objective on the board, and I talk about the difference between the, the old lesson objectives or a standard and actual learning targets. And an objective is written in teacher speak, right, whereas a learning target is written in student speak. Um, an, an objective is coming from the teacher to the student, where a learning target is created with the student together. Um, an objective is oftentimes very broad, whereas a learning target is something that's very specific. So, you know, you, you go ahead and you co-create these learning targets with your students, and then you monitor that progress throughout. You know, and then at the very end, 
you actually have a conversation with the students. You, I call them the brief conversations. You have a conversation with the students. You talk about, okay, this is what we were trying to accomplish. How did we do? And that's often what, when I talk about this with different, you know, uh, teachers and educational organizations, that's oftentimes the thing that's the most controversial is this idea of students self-reporting their grades, or I wrote an article on conversation-based grading. Um, but we know, and there's actual research to support the fact that students self-reporting their grade is oftentimes the most valid measure of their actual learning. So, so John Haiti wrote a fantastic book, Visual, Visual, Visible Learning for Educators, that synthesized, synthesized over you know, 150 different measurements for student learning. And the number one thing that came out to affect student learning was the student self-reporting of grades. That's what actually had the largest impact and the most positive impact um, on student learning. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to actually have a conversation with students as opposed to the two scenarios I described at the beginning of my answering this question, to actually be able to gauge what the student learning is as they go through this actual process. Very cool. That, you know, it's, it, you know, I just can't, Stop thinking about as as you're talking about this the you know the importance of uh, teachers giving this you know giving an opportunity for um, steam to be part of what they what they do in the classroom and you know it's uh, we have uh, you know when we're talking about trying to make things engaging the the whole thing that uh, needs to be there part of it is some sort of hands on um, where the, it's not just them sitting and and getting it. and uh, you know, when you uh, uh, when you're writing this book and talking about the types of things that, um, I mean, what comes to mind when you think about the types of things that a, a teacher can do to make the class uh, something that a kid wants to be in when you're talking about these subjects? Yeah, and I think you know a lot of it goes back to I, I have a chapter where I talk about student engagement because what I like to say is you know things like things like the robot is cool right but that coolness factor does fade away so how do you actually you know make sure that you're able to maintain student choice and engagement throughout you know there, there's a lot of different ways to do it but just just to kind of summarize a lot of those things for you is, is number one you have to get the assessment part of it right like we just talked about if the entire focus of what it is that you're doing is is around assessment then um then, then, then you're gonna fail number two you have to set the structure of your lessons correctly. So I have this thing called guided discovery learning. I think that I hope we get a chance to talk about, but that it talks about how to set up those lessons correctly. Uh, because if you're not sure what's expected out of you, then that's going to, that's going to demotivate you. You know, I, I've walked out of many faculty meetings and, and been like, what, what does he want us to do? I have no idea what the principal's asking us to do. And that's very demotivating. So making sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and, then, and then the third part of it is this idea of unexpected rewards. So, you know, if you ever if you ever fly into Las Vegas, as soon as you walk out of the plane in the airport, the first thing you see is a slot machine, right? <laughs> and it's the first thing that a casino, that's the first thing they figure out is where they're going to put the slot machines because the slot machines make the most money. And the reason why that is, it's, it's the neuroscience, man, because it's the dopamine, Right. It's not, it's the, it's the act of unexpected reward. That is what actually keeps you in. It's the fact that you could potentially win. It's not winning that motivates you. It's the idea that you can win. So, so having those unexpected rewards throughout your classroom, throughout your lesson, that's a very important part of maintaining student motivation. And that fits in perfectly with what it is that we're trying to do with STEM because the students are continuously learning as they go throughout the process and not, again, the, the, the quote-unquote evaluation, the learning just doesn't happen at the end. So going through a constant process of discovery and being able to change and pivot what you're doing as a result of discovery, that has the same effect as a slot machine. And so as a result of that, that helps to drive engagement as you move forward with it. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, you know what? Um, chapter 5 explores STEM teaching and guided discovery learning. Uh, can you explain what guided discovery learning is and how it can be applied in the context of STEM education for young learners? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, I talked about this a moment ago. We talked about student motivation. Um, but uh, just to kind of zoom out from that a little bit, when you think about guided discovery learning, I struggle with this a lot when I taught. What I struggle with was specifically, um, am I teaching knowledge or am I teaching skills, right? So especially as things like Google became more prevalent, 
the conversations we had as teachers was like, you know, well, do I really need to teach like these specific facts because students can just Google this stuff, right? So do I really need to teach like, you know, state capitals and stuff like that? Because you know, they can just Google what the state capital of Kansas is or, you know, what the mean temperature in this part of the world is, any of those particular things. Why do I need to teach us things? But instead, you know, we see these reports from the World Economic Forum and they talk about, you know, the most important skills in the 21st century are like, you know, solving and structured problems and stuff like that. You know, I need to be able to teach these skills. But there's a con there was always presented to me a conflict between those two things, right? You either had to do one or you had to do the other. And while I was responsible for my students scoring a certain level on, on my state proficiency test, that was more like in the knowledge realm, but I'm also being asked to do these things. I teach general problem solving, which is more in this in this skills realm. So, so what am I being asked to do? So what I wanted to make sure in my book was I was able to give teachers a solution to the knowledge versus skills debate. And really the, the, the problem is, is the fact that it's, it's a debate in and of itself because both of those things should be able to work together. Uh, the big fallacy that we have behind this is this idea that teaching skills is something that is generalizable. So, you know, I can I can create a strategy to play a video game. So therefore, you know, I'm a good strategist. And that's not actually true. We all have experienced this as teaching, right? So I used to teach my students in the language arts class, you know, how to write an effective paragraph. And then they go across the hall to my buddy Rob's room. And then Rob would want ask them to write an essay on a social studies test. And they'd be like, we have no idea how to do this. And so like, they lost all that knowledge on the five foot walk between my classroom to his, right? Well, we know what's actually going on there is, is in, in neuroscience, the principle of non-transferability. Just because you know how to do this in one specific content area does not mean that you're going to know how to do it in another content area. So this idea of teaching these generalizable skills like quote unquote problem solving, you know, that idea is built upon a faulty premise. Secondarily, we cannot think about things in a vacuum. We have to have some basis of background knowledge uh, or some knowledge foreground to us so that we can then actually engage in that thinking itself. So in that chapter, I go into a lot of the neuroscience behind this. But then at the end of the chapter, I give them some specific steps of how they can actually implement guided discovery learning, guided discovery learning in their classroom. So what it says, number one, is you have to have a clear goal. So you and the students have to be on the same page. So again, if I don't know what I'm, what's expected out of me or if I don't know what success looks like, that's very demotivating for the students. So I have to have a clear goal in order to be able to achieve or be able to understand what I need to do to achieve this thing. So that's the first step is, uh, is establish a clear goal with your students. And then secondarily, you have to foreground the skills that the students need in order to be able to do that. So that's a, that's a direct instruction, right? So if I need to be able to do this, um, I need to be able to have the skills to be successful. So when I was working for Carnegie Mellon University, I was involved in this robot algebra project. And this robot algebra project asked the students to use robots to teach all this proportional reasoning. And for the first two years of the study, we failed miserably. None of our students learned proportional reasoning, not because they didn't know the proportional reasoning, it's because they couldn't measure. So we're asking the students to do this measurement in, in, in the context of teaching proportional reasoning where they couldn't measure, so they couldn't do the higher level skills we wanted them to be able to do. So you have to make sure that you foreground all the skills that students need, and then you go through this process of formative assessment, that's step three, to make sure the students have all the basic skills that they need. But then the most important part is step four. Now you take the scaffolding away. Now you give them a more open-ended project that the students can apply everything that they just learned in a new context to see if they can actually do it successfully. So you, really what you're doing there is, is in education, we have this false dichotomy between knowledge and skills. I try to marry them together and I call it guide discovery learning. So at number one, you can set a clear goal for your students. You can then foreground all the essential knowledge or, or activate prior knowledge with your students. You can then go through this process of continually checking the student's understanding via formative assessment. And then once the students show the required fundamentals that are needed, you can take the scaffolding away and let them apply it on their own. And that's when the magic happens. It's awesome. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, I think about just how young some of the kids can start 
um, in yeah. these areas, which is uh, pretty amazing too. I, that uh, before you needed your parents to take you someplace, and we're much older and all that sort of stuff, but not not now. I like that. I you know, looking ahead, where do you where do you see the future of STEM education in elementary schools, and what advice do you have for educators and school administrators who who want to embrace and enhance STEM learning in their institutions? Yeah, I think number one, I think I see STEM education uh, becoming much more diverse. Um, so, uh, so again, you go to these places like um, Indonesia uh, or um, Vietnam. I spent a lot of time in Vietnam recently, and you know these countries, like, like Indonesia, you know has has an oil based economy. They don't want their economy to be oil based. Instead. They want their economy to be knowledge based, and they see STEM education as a means to be able to do that. Uh, so I see uh, I see a lot more diversity in STEM, uh, and, I, and I wrote about you know that trip to Australia and Vietnam, and and talking about that diversity in STEM. Um, obviously, you know even here in the United States, diversity among students from you know lower socio socioeconomic backgrounds and getting more females involved in STEM education. I think as you see more and more schools push STEM earlier, you're going to see more of those students involved in STEM. And that's just an amazing and wonderful thing. So I see STEM starting earlier. And as a result of that, I see STEM uh, becoming much more diverse uh, in, in these in the upcoming weeks and months and years as we talk about STEM education. So I think that's number one. I think that number two, um, I get this question a lot, obviously, because of the book and because of my job and because of my background. And oftentimes, you know, there, there's a but attached to it, right? So it's like, I want to start STEM education, but, and I, I want to implement STEM, but. And, and oftentimes that but involves cost. You know, that could be cost in terms of time. Like, how do I, I don't have time to train my teachers to be able to do that. Uh, that could be cost in terms of curriculum time, where I got to, you know, my, my math scores are terrible. So I got to really got to drill down on math. They got to learn the, the, this very specific and, and thin curriculum area. And of course, cost can be where we have to purchase items to be able to do this curriculum and, and, and implement, you know, we're going to do robots or, or like your like your son's robotics club or whatever it is. And I like to view it from a different perspective, the opposite perspective, which is what is the cost of not doing it? What is the cost of having more apathy in our classrooms? You know, we're talking about things like banning cell phones in schools. Why are we talking about that? Because school kids are on their phone and not listening to their teacher. Should we ban cell phones in schools? I just wrote an article on that. There's, there's, there's cases pro and con against that. But at the end of the day, it's about student apathy. Our kids are bored. Our teachers are bored. So what are we doing to address those particular issues? Teachers are burned out. One of the major reasons why is because they're bored. They're, they're trying to reach students that they're having a very difficult time to do it. That's the same situation I was in around year 14, 15, 16 in my teaching career. And what turned it around for me was STEM education. Now, is that going to turn it around for everyone? No, of course not. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. But I guarantee you it's going to turn it around for a lot of educators out there and for a lot of students out there. So what is the cost of not doing it? What is the cost of not introducing STEM early to our students for all the reasons I talked about a moment ago? What's the cost of not providing our students these meaningful learning experiences? What is the cost of not potentially re-energizing our teachers by getting them, by telling them it's okay to embrace failure and it's okay to have a lesson that doesn't go well. It's okay to not know all the answers. What is the cost of not doing that? So that would be the advice that I would give to your to your teachers and to your ministers listen to the podcast is to think about that. What's the cost of not implementing STEM in your classroom or your school? What a awesome question because uh, you know, that it literally could shut the door on so many different types of learning opportunities and, and things that uh, you know, need people in them or, you know, the people um, designing what they do or uh, looking at uh, um, you know, fixing something that's out of whack. I mean, there's any number of things that it's uh, by outlawing it or outlawing the devices that make it easy to use it. Ah, you know, we're going down an interesting road there. Um, you know, it, one of the things that uh, um, I got to make sure that we, uh, that I, I get you a chance to do is, is we're, we're getting close to finishing up here. You know, one of the things that are, uh, I'd like you to do is explain where people can find out more and, uh, and, uh, 
you know, get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more from you. Yeah, thank you for offering me the opportunity to share that. So obviously, you can follow me on Twitter, at McKenna J 72 um, I have a very active Twitter and LinkedIn account. You can search me on LinkedIn and connect with me there. Uh, secondarily, you can go to my website, jmckenna.org. You can go and find out everything else about me there. And also, you can subscribe to my newsletter um, on my website, which will include things that I'll be speaking at FETC in January. Uh, so includes information like that. So um, if I'm in your neck of the woods or your part of the country, you can come say hello to me. We can have a cup of coffee. Uh, but obviously, you can interact with me on those platforms also. Very nice. I have that information in the show notes so they can easily easily find that and reach out to you, which would be cool. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're wrapping up. And uh, um, any, any last second uh, before I ask you some questions that I like to generally ask my guests, any, any like last minute uh, commercial that you'd like to do, why they should read your book? You know, I think at the end of the day, if you, if you, if you should get my book because hopefully my book is, is allows you to reconnect with the reasons why you got involved in teaching in the first place. Obviously, my book is about STEM education, but at the end of the day, my book is about teaching students how to solve problems, teaching students how to collaborate, teaching students how to be more inquisitive, uh, making a more engaged and fun classroom. And I think that's something that we're all trying to do. And unfortunately, that's something that we don't talk about enough, you know, in, in our classrooms. Um, if you're a principal, please stop having uh, faculty meetings where you talk about test scores. Uh, please stop doing send it an email. Instead, talk to your teachers about what it is that they love about teaching and how you can do more of that. And that's that's what my book is trying to express. Love that. Love that. And that's a great great way to bring it all together. So thank you. So I got two last questions for you, Jason. And one is, one goes like this. How do you keep going when so much is going on that you may want to quit? Uh, this is, this is what I love to do. I was very lucky about the fact that at a young age, you know, I was lucky enough to find something I'm very passionate about, which is teaching. So, um, I don't have hobbies. This is what I, I love to think about, write about and talk about teaching and learning. So, uh, this is what I do. So I don't, I don't get burned out. I don't get tired. I don't get frustrated because, uh, this is, this is what I love to do. So I, when you find that thing that you love to do, uh, stick with it. Uh, and don't, don't let anyone else tell you what it is that you love to do. Find that within yourself. And then once you do that, you're in the position that I am, whereas you, you just, uh, you hop out of bed every single morning because this is what you really enjoy doing. Oh, I love that. That's good stuff. Uh, last question, Jason. Do you have a, a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you? You know, uh, I had a college professor. Uh, his name was Dr. Jim Starrett, who um, uh, really introduced this. This is going to be funny because we spent the last hour talking about STEM. Uh, but he really introduced me to the humanities. Um, and at the end of the day, I am a I am a humanities guy. I, I don't I am not spending my free time coding robots, but I am spending my free time uh, reading or watching Shakespeare, for example. And he was the guy, you know, that really made the humanities cool for me. You know, I, was, I played football, and you know, I, I thought I was pretty cool. And you know, that you know, why, why would I want to read the sonic and a sonnet? And you know, what the heck is the iambic pentometer? But you know. Uh, Dr. Starrett made me fall in love with that so much to the point I became a humanities TA, um, you know, my junior year, my junior senior years in college. And I, and I love that experience. And even before I was student teaching, uh, that was my first experience teaching. Uh, and, and I've been doing it ever since. So uh, that was that was really the, the professor that made a huge impact on my life. And he was he was just really a great guy also. So, um, yeah, that that'd be the teacher I remember the most. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing and, and remembering and, and uh, just bringing them to life here. I appreciate you do, doing that. Um, you know, Jason, thanks so much for sharing a bit about your book, What STEM Can Do for Your Classroom, and for all the work you do. I wish you the best. Wish you the best also. Thank you for having me. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcast by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes.
Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.